We were alone together in the house only a few days after the Winchell broadcast when Sandy removed the portfolio from under his bed and carried it into the dining room. There he opened it out on the table, reserved for entertaining the boss and celebrating special family occasions, and carefully lifted the Lindbergh portraits from the tracing paper protecting each drawing. and lined them up on the tabletop. In the first, Lindbergh was wearing his leather flying cap, with the loose straps dangling over each ear. In the second, the cap was partially hidden beneath the heavy goggles pushed up from his eyes and onto, the for onto his forehead. In the third, he was bareheaded, nothing to mark him as an aviator other than the uncompromising gaze out to the distant horizon. To gauge the value of this man, as Sandy had rendered him, wasn't difficult. A virile hero a courageous adventurer, a natural person of gigantic strength and rectitude, combined with, the, with a powerful blandness, anything but a frightening villain or, menace to man, or a menace to mankind. He's going to be president, Sandy told me. Alvin says Lindbergh's going to win. He so confused and frightened me that I pretended he was making a joke and laughed. Alvin's going to go to Canada and join the Canadian military, he said. He's going to fight for, for the British against Hitler. But nobody can beat Roosevelt, I said. Lindbergh's going to. America's going to go fascist. Then we just stood there together under the intimidating spell of the three portraits. Never before had being seven felt like such a serious deficiency. Don't tell anybody I've got these, he said. But Mom and Dad saw them already, I said. They've seen them all. Everybody has. I told them I tore them up. There was nobody more truthful than my brother. He wasn't quiet because he was secretive and deceitful, but because he never bothered to behave badly, and so had nothing to hide. But now, something external had transformed the meaning of those drawings, making them into what they were not. And so he told our parents that he destroyed them, making himself into what he was not. Suppose they find them, I said. How will they do that, he asked. I don't know. Right, he said. You don't. Just keep your little trap shut and nobody will find anything. I did as he told me, for many reasons, one being with the third oldest U.S. postage stamp I owned, which I couldn't possibly tear up and throw away, was a ten-cent airmail issued in 1927 to commemorate Lindbergh's transatlantic flight. It was a blue stamp, about twice as long as it was high, whose central design, a picture of the spirit of St. Louis flying eastward over the ocean, had provided Sandy with the model for the plane and the drawing celebrating it. his conception, adjacent to the white border. At the left of the stamp was the coastline of North America with the words New York jutting out, onto the, jutting out into the Atlantic, and adjacent to the border at the right the coastlines of Ireland, Great Britain, and France with the word Paris at the end of a dotted arc that charts the flight path between the two cities. At the top of the stamp, directly beneath the white letters that boldly spell out United States postage are the words Lindbergh Airmail, in slightly smaller type, but large enough certainly to be read by a seven-year-old with perfect vision, the stamp was already valued at 20 cents by Scott's Standard Postage Stamp Catalog. And what I immediately realized was that its worth would only continue increasing and so rapidly become my single most valuable possession if Alvin was right and the worst happened. And we'll pause there. <laughs>